Hi there, Grade 11s, and welcome to Module 1.4 of our Term 3 modules, where we're going to be looking at software. So let's jump in as we look at application software, multimedia software, communication software, some compatibility issues, and some other items as well. Uh, the biggest of them being the software for physically challenged users. So when we see these icons, what do these icons tell us? What do you think of when you see this? You think of operating systems. Operating systems from your phone, such as Android. Well, we know this one, self-explanatory, that's Apple, that's our iOS. We've got Linux, our open source software, and then we've got old faithful Windows from Microsoft. So when we see this, or these icons, we immediately think of operating systems. But what does the operating system actually do? And this is a question that comes up often. The functions of an operating system is that first of all, it manages the hardware components. So it's a software that manages all those physical hardware components in your PC. It provides you with the graphical user interface or our GUI. It provides a structure for file management. The fact that we can have files and have them, you know, uh, well, our files, our folders, um, have them in the C drive, the D drive, all of these different things. And it provides some built-in utilities as well. So that's our operating system. Now, when it comes to us wanting to, and since we're talking about software, we might, might want to install hardware. And it's funny that I'm talking about installing hardware, but I'm talking about software. So when we install hardware, we do so via two methods. The first one is plug and play. And that simply means that a component can be used as soon as the device is connected, like a flash drive. Our hot swappable, these are components that connect to the PC without switching the computer off. Now, this is a big thing because in the past, you had to switch the PC off before plugging anything else in. And think of it like adding a um, graphics card. You have to switch the PC off in order to put that hardware um, into the PC. Now, why am I talking about this? Simply because when we install these things, when we add these things, do we need software to go with this? And I want you to think of the simple example of a printer. I have my hardware, I plug it in, yes, it's plug and play, but do I need anything to get the hardware to actually work with the operating system? Yes, I do. This is a device driver. And you need to know this definition. What is a device driver? It is a software program that enables the operating system to communicate with the connected hardware device. So the device driver tells the operating system, listen, I have a, um, let's say, BizHub 4050i printer. This is what it can do. This is its various functions. Operating system says, thank you very much for that information. Now I know how to communicate with um, this piece of hardware. Okay, so don't forget those functions, managing the hardware, providing the user interface, providing a structure for file management and provides built-in utilities. So as we deal with our software, when you go to the shop and you want to buy um, a software package, and remember our software can be games as well. So you've, you've got a PC, you want to pick up a game, you want to buy a game, you've got to look at things like the minimum and recommended system requirements. And this is important because these requirements will influence what you can and can't buy. So this is why I'm saying on the slide, when buying software, a user should consider the minimum and recommended requirements. What does the, the minimum requirements mean? It's the things that you have to have, the specs that your computer system must have. So they might tell you they need a two gigahertz CPU. You need 16 gigs of RAM. You need Windows um, 10, for example. Those are your minimum requirements. Those are the things you have to have for the software to actually work. Now, the recommended requirements, which I would always recommend to you, are the things that you should have, okay? Specifications that your PC should have. It doesn't necessarily have to have it, but it should have it. This allows the software to be used much easier and there'll be better usability if you have the recommended specs uh, on your PC. So let's use an example. Starcraft. I don't know if any of you remember this, but uh, this particular game, yeah, we've got a screenshot of it and we've got the required 
or in other words, the minimum PC system specs um, that's required, and we've got the recommended. So look at the minimum. Minimum of Windows 8 with the latest service pack. 2.6 gigahertz processor, 128 meg uh, GeForce graphics card or better. Do you see that? Or better. 12, 12 gigs of available hard drive space. 1 gig. 1 gig of RAM. And a broadband internet connection um, and this display resolution. Now, look at the recommended. It's recommended that you don't have Windows 8, but rather Windows 10. Why? Because it, the game will obviously work better. There'll be more fluid movement and things like that on Windows 10. They spoke here about 2.6 gigahertz Pentium. Yeah, they're talking about a dual-core processor. So it's advisable, recommended, that you have a more powerful CPU. 1 gig of RAM, 2 gigs of RAM recommended. And instead of 128 meg GeForce graphics card, they're talking about a 512 megs graphics card or a higher rated um, ATI one as well. So this is important. Now, when you're playing games and things like this, you always go for the recommended. Okay, otherwise you're going to have issues down the line. Now, when you install this software, you might get asked about a full or custom installation. And so we want to know the difference. If I just click next, 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 and I say full installation, it means that everything that is required, recommended, and the optional features of the software is going to be installed. Everything is going to be installed. Whereas with the custom installation, the required features are installed, but everything else I can actually go and select through what I want in terms of the recommended and optional features. I can decide exactly what I want, but the program itself or the game will still install. Okay, then we have multimedia software. Now remember when we talk about multimedia, we're talking about different types of media, so that can be um, audio, video, you know, any of these. It's used to create or view multimedia content. So the software allows us to be able to do that. To combine text, sound, images, drawings, animations, and video to communicate ideas. And uh, a very popular way to create multimedia is by using HTML5. Now, folks, there's so many other examples these days, and I'll just give you one that I end up using, which is CapCut. Um, it's a piece of software. It's an app. Many of you have used it as well. You can record video. You can record audio. You can add, you know, pictures to the video, all these types of things to end up making your little video. So that's also an example. There are also new types of multimedia products that have come about, and this is why I am mentioning this. You've got interactive multimedia textbooks as well that are created sometimes for specific devices such as the iPad. You have communication software. This software is used to make electronic communication simple. Remember, all of these, all of these things, these, these are pieces of software, right? What is it there to do? It's designed to facilitate easy communication. So email programs, web browsing, online chat rooms, instant messaging, VoIP software, all of this falls under the umbrella of communication software. Now, you can have compatibility issues. That means the hardware and the software might not work together. The two versions of the software might not uh, work so well together. So let's look at a few reasons for compatibility issues. Now, every company has a different way to encode data in files. And the software expects data to be encoded in a certain way. And when it's not done that way, there could sometimes be an error message or a scrambled document. There are a few solutions that they give us. They say we can export, in other words, save the document in another format. So maybe it's to an older version of a Word document, you know, from .docs to .doc. Um, we could import it or open it with another or in another format, we could upgrade our particular version. And this is the beautiful one that's in many companies, they standardize things. In other words, everybody uses the same version of the software so that we avoid compatibility issues. Now, software is not without its issues. There are things called software bugs. And a software bug is basically an error in a program caused by the way it has been programmed. 
You do have some tools for combating this, and many of you have seen this. We can test it with beta versions. There's error reporting, and this is why we keep our software up to date. Speaking of which, updating our software. What does that mean? It's the process of getting the latest bug fixes or obtaining additional new features. Um, when you go to Office, for example, you can check the help and go to check for updates. You can do the same with Windows. You can do a lot with some of the programs um, and software that you have available as well. Then you'll find, and you saw with, with the specs that we had, they spoke about server specs. So I'm just going to give you a brief explanation of that. When we talk about service packs, we're talking about a collection of all the previous updates for the last period of time. So that could be updates over the last six months, updates over the last year. This is why you sometimes have, or you'll see things talking about service pack one, service pack two, etc. When we talk about updates, talking about the software regularly checking for updates, and these are usually automatically downloaded and installed. An update is important. Don't just throw it to the side or block it to say, no, I don't have time for this. Um, there are things that sometimes need to be changed and updated and sorted out uh, because of some of the issues that some other people might have picked up or the developers themselves. Now, we also have online software. And you can see there's the picture showing us online software being on the internet and offline just being on our local hard drives on our computers. So, we hear these terms, online software, cloud computing, web applications. The software actually runs on servers on the internet. So there are physical servers somewhere else in the world, um, whether they are near you or not, but it runs on these servers and then you are accessing it via the internet. Now, there are some advantages. And again, you know that we only need to know two. So the software is always up to date because you don't have to manage it. You don't download anything. It doesn't take up space on your machine. Um, that server CPU may be far more powerful than your own. So these are just a few advantages. The disadvantages, well, the big one is that you need an internet connection and you need a solid internet connection if you really want to use the software efficiently. If you don't have an internet connection, obviously you can't connect. You don't have control over the backup policy or the data security. Um, you may need to pay a monthly fee, you know, and it might run slower again, like I said at the beginning, depending on your internet connection. Now, a typical example of this is Google Docs. Free software, web-based word processor, presentation and spreadsheet application. So that's your whole lovely Google suite over there that you can use. There are blogs, which are online publishing tools. So... Um, WordPress, Blogger, Squarespace, there are a number of other examples. And please, again, as I always say, if you have an example that is valid, but that's maybe not in these presentations or not in the textbook, feel free to use those as well. Speaking of blogs, let's look at some good practices when blogging. Now, again, you just need to know about two of these. You want to update your blog frequently and you want to interact with your readers, right? You want to be casual while being interesting as well. Some advantages is that you get to share ideas and get feedback. Personal and business use. There are a lot of people who started with blogs on a personal basis and it's developed into um, a business. And some folks are yeah, doing quite well with that. This is what's eventually led to vlogging um, as well. Okay, it can be used in help forums, can be used for social change, etc. There are some disadvantages. Again, you can go through that because there's sometimes a lot of ads and you've got to update it constantly, etc. So if you're into that, you know what? All the best. All right, then we have our standalone or desktop apps that you can see there. Now, a standalone or desktop app application, sorry, application, runs on a computer without any need to interact with any other software. So that program works alone. It does not need to be in a group. It does not come installed via a suite or anything like that. It's just on its own, and the application uses the hardware and operating system of the computer to perform its functions. That is what we call standalone software or desktop apps. We also have web and cloud-based applications. So here we've got the web application, <laughs> and here we've got the cloud-based application, and they're shaking hands, they're working together. But let's look at the difference between the two. A web-based application 
is a program or software that runs on your web browser. So you've got to open the web browser. That web browser then contacts or is based on uh, a web server somewhere else. And you can then access those particular resources. And there we have our web-based applications. Remember now they run on a remote server that you can access with your web browser. Okay, so again, I'm, I'm just doing this again so that you can fully understand um, that our web application runs on your web browser. Now that is slightly different to our cloud-based application. Our cloud-based application, there's a more, it's well, it's really a more advanced form of a web-based app. And they need a web browser to run but they are not totally reliant on the web browser to function. So I hope you get in the difference here, right? I'm going to go through it again. They need a web browser to run, but they're not totally reliant on the web browser to function. Users typically only pay for the service that they need. Okay, so let's run through this again. You can see with our cloud apps, they require continuous internet connection, whereas our web applications can operate offline. They can be installed locally. Um, this is just showing you the difference between the two. Please know how to define the two. Know the difference between them as well. Okay. Then we have software for physically challenged users. Now, our operating systems contain settings and utilities to help make the computer easier for disabled people to use. And if you go to control panel and ease of access, you can see all the different features that they have there. We've got ease of access settings where you can magnify an area of the screen, text to speech, make um, the mouse cursor larger. We've got a number of different features. We've got our sticky keys um, where you can use keyboard shortcuts or type capital letters without pressing more than one key at a time. Slow keys help you insert a short pause between the press of a key and the display of the letter on the screen. So again, these are just features that are there um, that come with the operating system as well. We've got eye and head tracking applications in gaming. And this involves using the camera using camera tech and software to translate the position of your eyes or head into digital commands. What about voice recognition software? Now this is an alternative to typing on a keyboard. It takes the user's speech and turns it into text on the screen. Now you need to be careful with that because a lot of this is American based. So you suddenly have to change your accent to make sure that your accent is like an American, <laughs> not a South African. <laughs> okay. Um, our voice recognition works by analyzing sounds and converting them to text. This tool is useful for fully or partially visually challenged people. Okay, so there, there's a use for all of this. We've got screen readers. Screen readers are software programs that allow blind or visually impaired users to read the text that's displayed on the screen with a speech synthesizer or braille display. It also allows the user to hear out loud everything that is being displayed on the monitor. Now the simple one is just the magnification tool. And this is the last one we're going to go through. It's a software that really just allows the user to zoom in closer to work being displayed on the screen. And folks, that's it for the module.